We're going to start off uh, by the acceptance of the minutes from our February 1st meeting. I'm sure that everybody's looked over those. So we want to first start off by um, I will accept a motion or we'll, looking for a motion to accept the minutes as presented. So moved. All right, in a second. Thank you. All right, we're going to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Motion passed unanimously. Thank you guys for that. Um, now we're going to move into the second agenda item introductions. First, we have Lori Cunningham. It's going to be our liaison from the school board. Why don't you say hi and just a few words, Lori, if you would. Okay, good morning. I'm excited to be here. Um, spent a number of years on this committee and um, definitely is near and dear to my heart. So i um, looking forward to working with everyone. And to me, it's one of the most important committees that the district has because it's looking over our fiduciary responsibility um, to our taxpayers. So I appreciate your willingness and each of you that serve and of course to staff as well. So thank you. I'm a little under the weather today. So anyways, um, but glad to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Lori. Ms. Arroyo, you're new to, the, to uh, our meetings here. I want you to introduce yourself. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Divina and this is my first year with um, Paul County Public Schools. Welcome, thank you for being a part. So we'll go right into the finance update. Take it away. Good morning. Heather. Good morning. How are you all? Um, I'm Heather Jenkins. And as soon as I figure out how to share my screen, I have a couple different things to go over with you today. Um, these are presentations that we had given to the board that I thought might be useful for you to see. So first off, um, we did a presentation, or I did a couple weeks ago on our upcoming budget. We have received our um, conference report, which is the report that the Senate and the House um, decide upon and they forward to the governor. It's our starting point for our budget process. Um, I've done a little bit of a breakdown to show you all a comparison. We get four calculate, well, we get five calculations each year from the Florida Department of Education, and those calculations specify our Florida Education Finance Program funding, the FEFP. So as you can see here, we have our third calculation, which is what we're working off now. We're currently waiting on the fourth, um, which is where we will finish up our school year. And then the fifth comes in October, and that's where we do a true up. It shows the um, actual FTE we earn and um, our final adjustments to this fiscal year. Sometimes we get a little bit more funding, sometimes we get a little bit less. So um, this shows that right now we have a little over 112,000 FTE, which is full-time equivalent. Those aren't actual student bodies. Um, they do um, a, a weight. So an example would be if we have one student that's in our high school 60% of the time, and then um, in virtual 40% of the time, they would have a weight of 0.6. So that, that kind of helps explain why it's a little bit different than um, actual kids. We're projecting right now for 2223, 20, 116,000 students. That includes our schools, charter schools, public, public schools for our schools, um, virtual students, um, and something called the Family Empowerment Scholarship, which we'll get into um, a little bit later. These items highlighted in blue are called categoricals. So for categoricals, these funds can only be spent on specific things. So turnaround is for those schools the lowest 300 schools, and they're to help bring those students back up to the level they need to be. So we receive funding for that. Um, the others, they're pretty self-explanatory, safe schools to help pay for our SROs and our student safety. 
mental health allocation. We've seen an uptick since the pandemic in students that require mental health assistance and a little bit more support. We have our TSIA, teacher salary increase, that's to help get our salaries for teachers up to 47.5. SAI, supplemental academic instruction, that's typically used for anything considered remediation. You can use it for an extra hour, um, tutoring, anything, again, to help bring our students up to the level that they need to be. Reading allocation, instructional materials. Um, one thing to note is they've, got, they've eliminated the digital classroom allocation this year, but we have received a lot of funding in ESSER for our federal funds. And for those dollars, um, we're able to put that into our, our digital enhancement. Our district is going one-to-one. -one, so we've utilized a lot of grant funds in that process and expect that to take place next year. We have several of the devices in already. And then we have our transportation allocation. Um, another important thing to note, I'll use transportation as an example. Sometimes we spend upwards of 36 million and we only receive 29.8. So our costs are greater than the allocation. And when that happens, we draw from our discretionary funding. On the right side, you can see um, what the differences are in this year from last year. The largest is in the TSIA allocation. Um, we did have a few other decreases. And this may bring questions. <laughs> we have, this is our um, weighted FTE times our base student allocation times the district cost, cost differential. What a weighted FTE is, is um, a specific weight is assigned for each um, group of students. For example, K through three basic ESE students, um, they all have a weight that's multiplied by our base student allocation. And this year it's gone up to $14. And then multiplied by the district cost differential, which is supposed to level the playing field based on the different economic structures across the state. So Polk has a different DCD than for example, Miami-Dade or St. Lucie County. Um, no, these items here, prior year adjustment, proration to the appropriation and student reserve allocation, those show up in our third calculation. So you won't ever see that on a conference report on your initial funding. Um, there are adjustments that take place after the fact. And this year, the legislature and DOE had a pot of money set aside. So they have offset our proration to appropriation. So it's actually a net zero. Another important piece, the Family Empowerment Scholarship is not included in the conference report numbers. Um, initially, this amount was supposed to also be offset by the student reserve allocation, it was not. But we have been told as, as districts that there is an adjustment coming in the fourth calculation. So we are eagerly awaiting to see what that adjustment will be. All in all, there's a net, um, well, an increase of $74.4 million in additional funding. That can be deceptive. Um, the Family Empowerment Scholarship, I have another quick presentation to go over with y'all to explain that in detail, so I won't go into that here. Um, but if you see, they've changed the legislation. I'll get into that detail. We have in 2019, McKay and Family Empowerment totaled 11.2 million. In 2020, it was 14.5, remained steady for 21-22 as of the second calc. And then between the second and the third calc, it jumped to 41.1 million. So how this funding works is it comes off the top of the district allocation. Um, the variance between the, first, the second and the third calc this year is 26.7 million. Um, we had to identify funding to cover that difference. And then in 21-22, we're projecting a 34.3 million dollar increase over this year. So what does all this mean? Our K through 12 total funding increase is 74.5 million. When you take off the dollars for the Family Empowerment Scholarship, the additional over budget, 
is 34.4. You remove categorical funding because it can only be spent on certain items, that's 19.7 million, leaving us with discretionary funding, which we can spend on anything of 20.4. The legislator, legislature has mandated that we increase the minimum base salary to $15 an hour for all groups um, that fall under that level. For us, the cost is 14 million. We have a prior negotiated salary increase. Um, we had a two year agreement with PEA, our teacher union, and the cost above what it will take to get the, the people under 15 up will be 650,000. We also had a two year agreement with AFSME. So the cost over 15 is 1 million, cost over what it costs us to bring them to $15 an hour. And then we're looking at um, we're looking at our health insurance plan. Right now, it, it appears that we need to make an additional $14 million con dollar contribution to start bringing our plan into a healthy position. We do not meet our 60-day requirement for the 11208 filing. Our, um, we did contribute $10 million from ESSER funding to offset COVID claims. So that brought our health fund into the positive and did help it. Um, but we're still facing some challenges in that area. And for our FRS increases, uh, the, le the, board, the legislature has raised the FRS rate and modified some of the contribution amounts. So we anticipate that'll be about 4.57 million. Where does that leave us? 13.8 million negative out of new funding. So things we haven't taken into consideration. As we bring employees up to $15 an hour, we have to modify our salary schedule. For several of those, that means compression may come into play. For example, we may have a person on level one that makes $11 an hour. And then we may have a person on level 14 that makes $15 an hour. So when you bring level one up to level 14, all the levels in between are compressed. And then you could have had an employee that's here for seven years, making what we bring a new employee in at. Um, that's a, an interesting calculation to try and figure out. So that's what we're working diligently with our unions right now to um, see, if, see how we may address that issue. We've also adopted zero-based budgeting in our departments. And what that means is each budget request isn't based on last year, it's based on what are your goals and objectives and what's your justification? What are you spending those dollars on? So each line is itemized with specific reasons so that we can review those. We're also looking at a staffing model revision at both school level and district level to ensure that we have the employees that we need um, to serve our students and families. And then we're also reviewing job descriptions, which may have associated salary adjustments. The final piece is, um, as you all know, we go through the year and we continue to review our fund balance. We haven't um, calculated the final amount yet. We'll go over our financials with you, but that will continue to change as we get closer to June 30th. And that will play a role in next year's budget as well. So the Family Empowerment Scholarship. Um, the first several slides of this explain what it is. And if you, um, I believe Carol sent this out to you guys. So if you want to read in detail, you can, but I'll go over the, the short version. <laughs> um, the McKay Scholarship, the Gardner Scholarship were rolled into Family Empowerment. Um, the Family Empowerment Scholarship gives the same amount of funding for FTE for for the family empowerment that a regular student earns. The only difference is the amounts of the scholarship are based on the conference report, which is what we just looked at. And as we go through the year, our funding can change depending on if we grow or if our students go down. And an interesting thing that affects the, what causes the proration is, for example, they have one pot of money for the FEFP, and that pot goes for adjustments for the entire state. So if Polk grows exponentially and all the other districts grow as well, 
that pot has to be prorated. So we won't earn the entire amount of funding for one student. We may earn a sixth of it or a third. <clears throat> it just depends on the growth. The family empowerment amount remains steady. Um, there's also a couple payment schedules. I don't think I sent those to Carol, but I can to send out to you all if you wanna see. The amounts for 2022 have not been set to date, um, but they should be out shortly. So as we go down um, to slide nine, what I've done here is I've shown the number of FTE that we have in each unit. There are two, two scholarships, the FESEO, Equal Opportunity, and the FESUA, Unique Abilities. UA is where the McKay and Gartner kids fall and um, they receive a higher allocation. So we're projecting that in total, we will go up 1.9, 1,914 kids. Um, Polk's total growth is projected to be 3,916 kids more. So if you look at the Family Empowerment Scholarship recipients for 21-22, they're 4% of our total FTE. And for 22-23, they are five, we're projecting 5%. Um, so it's a 1% growth rate. Now in these groups of kids, things that we have to look at is the Garner Scholarship is included, but there are 979 children in that currently. Our current McKay numbers are 1,087. So as of 22-23, those students will fully roll into the Family Empowerment Scholarship. For the first year, they're guaranteed the base rate or um, their current scholarship amount, whichever is greater. We have homeschool children on FES. There's 307 of those. Of our Family Empowerment McKay Scholarship recipients, there are 55 pre-K students. And then new to Family Empowerment in 21-22, which is this current year, there were 3,000 new students. That just tells a little bit about homeschool. Um, they are actually coded twice. They're coded for enrollment under family empowerment and also under homeschool. And this is a breakdown of the number of students using FES. So you see pre-K is pretty low. All those are ESE. Kindergarten is pretty high. <laughs> then we go down, um, it averages off a little bit between first and third. See another little jump in fourth. And then around seventh, it, it increases and 11th and 12th are the highest groups. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we've anticipated the dollars. So um, the 2021 maximum award amount, I use those. I'm confident they'll be higher because the base student allocation has gone up, but I wanted to have a starting place just to show an example. Um, so for 2021, our estimated amount, yeah, our maximum, oh, 2021 maximum amount with our 22-23 estimated FTE is 46.8 million. There's also a transportation allocation. The EO students can get $750 to transport them to a school, even one of our schools of choice. Um, I haven't been able to find out to date if that comes off our funding. DOE said they don't have an answer yet. So I'm waiting for that. And the total um, would be close to 50 million. This next slide um, just tells, it shows how comp complicated the FEFP funding formula is. Starts out with your base and then goes down to how all the different categoricals are added, just for illustration. And that's the rest of, of the funding formula. Um, talked about that piece already. And then I listed some sources if anyone wanted to do additional research because it, it is fairly complicated, the whole calculation and process. So 
Before I move on to our financials and our investments, do y'all have any questions about these two pieces? Okay, we will move on. Um, <clears throat> we have for you a monthly portfolio summary as of February 28th. Um, here on the first page, you can see our core investment, the balance and the month end yield. As you can see, rates are still pretty low. Um, we have a, a, a meeting with our investment advisors again next week to talk about this. We have moved some of our funding, um, have been working to move some of our funding into commercial paper for a little bit of an increased yield. It's a balance because liquidity is, is important to a school district. So we have to maintain liquidity while trying to obtain the greatest yield. So we're continuously working with them to review the market, review our opportunities and, and where we can go from there. But on a positive note, we've maintained, um, maintained our, our growth and hope to see that pick back up again. This is our allocation. You can see how we have our accounts split up. The largest portion is in our intergovernmental investment pool. Um, I believe that's our sales tax. And then you know, we have some in money markets. We have some in, in our bank balance. Like I said, we have to remain a certain amount of cash on hand for payroll and expenditures. This shows the market value, um, our individual issue, issuer limits, all are in compliance. We'd had a question, I believe it was last time or the time before, there were some investments that were out of compliance. It was a timing issue. So all those have been corrected. And then we have a summary of our sales tax bond. This amount will continue to decrease as we spend down our sales tax. We have several projects committed to that but we try to maintain a little bit of an interest rate as high as we can get in the process of spending those funds down. And we also have our impact fees invested as well. We receive those from the county based on projects. So as we identify a project, we send a request to the county, they send the balance for the impact fees. Can I jump in, Heather? Yes, ma'am. Hi, this is Lisa Hester, um, the accounting director. I just wanted to add um, onto Heather's talk of the investments. We did um, in March, actually over spring break, invested $100 million into the commercial paper through a short-term account that we set up through Fifth Third. Um, I'm actually pretty excited about it because the interest rates are climbing on there. I tried to get a statement for the month of April, um, before this meeting, I wasn't able to get it um, yet. We should be getting in the next couple of days, but we are, uh, again, very excited that I think there's going to be some really good returns uh, on our money through that $100 million. Also, uh, to add to the impact fee, uh, we got another $48 million from BOCC on the impact fee, so that also would increase another 48 million on that slide as well. So again, we're pretty excited. Um, the interest rates are climbing up slowly, so we should see some pretty good returns on our money. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, do, you, do you wanna go over the monthly financials? Um, yeah. Not a whole lot. This is pretty self-explanatory. The first two pages explaining um, the percentage of changes. Uh, significant part is the fund balance um, increasing the projected of the 7.16. That's that's a pretty good jump up on there. Uh, under special revenue, we did have to uh, decrease the fund balance on the food service side. The food costs. Uh, have increased tremendously. So we had to reduce that by 4 million. We still look good in that fund. 
we had a very nice um, padding on the fund balance. So not real concerned about it. Just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention that um, the food, as everyone knows, the food costs are, are increasing. Nothing else in specific that I wanted to highlight on that report. Unless anyone has any questions on it. Um, I'd like to add to, to the fund balance discussion. So this is as of March. And as Lisa said, uh, we did have a little bit, a pretty good jump to 7.16. We've been reclassing expenses. Um, it took quite a while to have the ESSER grant expenditures approved. So prior to that, we set up an account in, in the general fund where we um, have been spending those dollars. So once we received approval, we're reclassing those expenses to the federal grant. And that will continue to affect the fund balance as we make those reclassifications. Heather? Just, just to clarify, so those spending those federal funds, does it, that's not part of this? It is, um, some of it. So for example, ESSER 1 has been spent completely and has been reclassed to this point. So we won't see any more adjustments. ESSER 2, we received, a, I guess you could call it a soft approval. Some of the items we had in there were payroll costs that we incur. For example, um, additional hours for the teachers, overtime for the custodians. Those are paid for out of the general fund anyway, but they were approved in our ESSER grant. So as we reclassify that payroll expense, the expense will hit the grant and we'll see general fund dollars freed up, which will go to increase the fund balance. Okay, so, so from the first allocation, none of that is showing up in this. And from the second allocation, you're working on getting that pulled out of these numbers. Yes, ma'am. One, there may be a little bit from one that shows um, that's already been reclassed, but most of that was in last year. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? I know that was a lot, so thank you all for listening. I just wanted to add one more thing to the committee, um, actually not specific to the um, financials, but just to let everyone know that uh, we had the state auditors last year from the Auditor General. This year we have Clifton, Larson, Allen again. We had them two years ago. We have done the initial planning meeting with them. Uh, so we're starting to move forward on the audit. We're also in the process of getting ready to close out the year we send all the information to the schools the memos all those types of things so we are moving forward on getting the books closed for june 30th and again um working with clifton larson allen thanks lisa mm -hmm. heather can i ask another question <laughs> of course with the federal funding do we see that? Where do we see that the ESSER? So it's in special revenue. Okay. Um, the actual, well, that's food service, other grants. So we have, um, Here's your total, our beginning fund balance was a little low. Here's your total revenue for, for grants, but other is where ESSER shows up. So your revenue and your expenditures, <clears throat> excuse me, are really, really close. And the reason for that is they're reimbursement grants. So we have to actually show the expenditure before we can draw down the fund. And then, um, then after we show, if it has taken place in the general fund, or the federal fund. We show the expenditure, draw down the funding, make any adjusting entries we have to to reflect the expense in the proper fund, which would be the federal, and then it goes from that point. Does that help? 
So is the federal fund anywhere that we can see? The federal fund, yes, it's in special revenue. My balance sheet. Excuse me while I scroll. <laughs> So they're all combined. If you wanted to see um, see it separately, then we could pull a report for you, but you'll see the federal through state is the largest portion. So that's where the ESSER dollars show up. Okay. But this shows food service, it shows um, our, all of our federal grants for presentation. And then there's a comparison. I have, um, if you're interested in what we've gotten, we got 30.6 million in ESSER 1. ESSER 2 was broken into different groups. We got 24.4 or 24.5 for academic acceleration in ESSER 2. 86.9 for lump sum, 4.9 for non-enrolled students, and 6.1 for technology assistance. Recently, we, we did receive a memo from DOE, so for the academic acceleration, which is 24.5, and the non-enrollment, which is five, um, anything that hasn't been expended as of the time that the governor signs the budget will revert back to DOE. They are redistributing those funds for a smaller scope. So the impact that that has on us as a district is anything that doesn't fit within that scope, we have to find an alternate funding source or cancel the project. So fortunately, um, a large portion of what we had budgeted will fit into that scope. And for those other items, um, we can, we are looking to move them to ESSER 3 or to our lump sum as our allocation. It's um, something similar happened last year with our ESSER gear grant. DOE pulled back all the funds that hadn't been drawn down to date. Um, it's, it's not something that is easy for us to deal with, but, but we will deal with it. And um, it's, Noted in the back of the implementing bill, it's a, a very large document when they publish the budget, there's extra language in the back of the bill. And how it works is the front of the bill addresses the current, the 22-23 upcoming year. The back of the bill can actually address current year or future year. So it's a place where they put extra things. And then um, for ESSER 3, we have, been approved for 275.4 million. Is that helpful? These ESSER grants, are they, I mean, is there gonna be an ESSER four or an ESSER, is it gonna continue or is this third one the last one we're gonna get? I'm fairly confident the third is the last that we're gonna get. <clears throat> These grants are to be used for one-time expenditures and not recurring amounts. Um, so it's important. Several years ago, we got, um, districts got a, a different type of um, grant. It's escaping me right now. Race to the top. Um, and then we also had, had um, ARA money at one point. That's it. That's the one I was trying to think of. Thank you. Um, ARA funds. And we were advised whenever we receive the ESSER grants to be mindful of what happened with the RF funds. So a few of our neighboring districts had used that funding to either enhance salaries or to add positions and then didn't remove those positions once the funding came to an end. So it put them in a very bad financial position. We are not doing that. Um, salary enhancements, 
that we have done to help our employees that have gone above and beyond have been in the form of a supplement, um, a one-time supplement. So that's non-recurring, but it does compensate them for their additional work to present. Thank you. That's what I was getting at. I was wondering all this money coming in, are we, are we creating projects that are gonna have to be sustainable after those funds are gone? No, ma'am, we've been very careful not to do that. That's an excellent question. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Ms. Jenkins. I appreciate you and the thoroughness of your reporting. Um, it's You're always welcome. entertaining to, to, to see how in-depth that, that, that can get. So, and thank you, Terry, for, for chiming in and asking those important questions. We'll move on to the one question. My hands oh, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, Ms. Brooks. That's all right. That's all right. Just have a quick question. Is this the first time, Heather, that we've utilized commercial paper? Yes. And okay. I want to say thanks to Lisa for chiming in. Do you want to expand on the commercial paper piece, Lisa? Um, no, just yes she heather's correct that the commercial paper is the uh, first time we've ever moved into that arena um but again the the interest rates are climbing so we really think we're going to get a great return on our money with them so we did that it actually in uh three month four month five month and six months we did 25 million in each so that we do have access to that money as it matures um so we, we did it with the advice of the financial advisor um, so that we would have access to that money. So it wouldn't all be tied up for the full six months. Mm -hmm. So I, I, would be, I would be remiss if I didn't ask the question being from that industry, how, how does that selection process go when choosing an institution to partner with? So it was again, recommended by our financial advisor, Water Walker who um, put us with Fifth Third, and we opened up a short-term account with Fifth Third. They have um, additional money and something that's not a short-term account with us. So we went with them, we put it all in the one account, and uh, Water Walker actually does the, the monitoring of that. Yeah. And Lisa and her team, I, I feel extra comfortable because they've worked really hard on our cash flow analysis to to see the ebb and flow of revenue so they really put a lot of work in to figuring out how much money we can safely move to commercial paper since it is tied up a little bit longer so they they've done a great job well there is every indication that we're going to see continue to see rate increases so it, it is exciting from that standpoint um i i I can almost tell you with a surety that the next time the Fed meets, it will see another one. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so I appreciate that. Thank you, um, Heather and your team for, for that. Um, we're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is the internal audit update. My neighbor. Hi. Today, Carol, <laughs> take it away. Stay invisible. <laughs> you can move, you can move. No, no, I'm, I like this. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen too, so that y'all can look at something other than a blank space. Hopefully. That's not right. Can y'all see my PowerPoint that said that says outside organization? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is an outside organization audit. We do these as needed. So <clears throat> if they pop up based on different scenarios, and this one was a parent complaint, um, they contacted the superintendent and, you know, just uh, demanded basically that the PTO be audited. There had been a change in administration and they were unhappy and suspicious of things. So we looked into it and um, just to give you a little point of reference, the fund balance at the beginning of the year was almost 26,000 and the school's internal accounts was only, and this is a Philip O'Brien Elementary PTO. The school's internal account balance was only 7,800, which is unusual. You don't typically see more in an outside bank account than you would 
um, in, you know, a um, internal account. So our findings after sampling some uh, records for the current year were that documentation for deposits was insufficient, collections were not itemized, there was no record of who the funds were collected from or how much was collected from each person, um, checks did not have two signatures, and the yearbook contract and invoice were in the school's name. And that's kind of what you get into when you turn your books over to an outside organization, because it really just depends on their level of expertise. And these are volunteers, so it can range from not experienced at all to maybe a, a bookkeeper. But in this case, you know, this is what we found. So our overall finding and recommendation was that most collections that were currently handled by the PTO, uniform t-shirts, yearbooks, faculty dues, and vending commissions should be accounted for in the school's internal accounts. So if they follow the policies and procedures set forth in our um, procedures, our internal accounts manual, then collections would be properly documented and accounted for. Um, so I'll let CC talk about inventory now, unless someone has a question. Good morning. Um, normally, inventory is taken at the end of the school year, but two of our maintenance shops were um, getting new managers, so they wanted to do inventories in those two shops to so that the new manager would come in with a correct, clean inventory. Um, one of the shops had a larger adjustment, which is 1.9%. And whenever an adjustment is over 0.5%, we ask the manager to um, report on that and give an explanation as to why. Um, after researching it, they found that the material was not properly charged out to jobs and there was a lack of physical control over the inventory. They've assured us that with the new management, they've come up with new policies in place to make sure that this was not going to happen again and everything was charged out properly. Um, a full inventory, we didn't file or um, issue a report on those inventories because a full inventory count is going to be done now in May and June um, on those two shops. So we'll report on everything at that time. Um, um, that's it on inventory. So then we had a school audit. We don't typically do the school audits because we um, have a firm, Car Riggs and Ingram, that do all schools at the end of the year. But this school principal requested that we come right in because she had concerns. And so we, um, we did. And we found that the principal's secretary was juggling a lot of jobs responsible for payroll, financial accounting, and terminal operator duties, which is a heavy load. Um, so right there, you're kind of set up for it problems. Um, they did fill another position, a terminal operator position, which took some of the duties off of the one secretary. But of course, we had more than the average number of findings. Deposits to the bank were not timely. Collections by teachers were not turned into the office daily. Collections were not properly documented on receipts. Not Cash was not itemized. Um, the secretary prepared receipts on behalf of teachers. Errors and omissions were on deposit reports for account coding dates, et cetera. And purchasing card account coding errors, we found and with, with the accounting in with receipts and three accounts were in deficit status. So I held a conference with the principal and secretary to go over each finding, and I recommended that they both take the training available to them. The principal is fairly new to the district. I recommended that the secretary shadow an experienced financial secretary from another school. Like I said, the vacant terminal operator position was filled, removing some of the duties from the one secretary. And I recommended that the principal provide more supervisory oversight, at least until the accounting improved. There's no questions, and I'll let CC talk about payroll.
Okay. Um, payroll is our largest expense um, in the district's operating budget. So we perform payroll audits um, continually and as, um, as allowed. And if other stuff comes up, like the audits that Carol spoke about, um, of course, they take precedence and then we just continue back on our audits. Um, Davina being new, she's learning the process and she's been working diligently on payroll audits. Um, this past quarter, we audited three schools, Auburndale High School, Denison Middle, and Lake Alfred. While Auburndale High School had minimal findings, Denison and Lake Alfred had more than typical number and severity of findings. We recommended that the principal provide increased supervisory oversight. Um, some of the findings at Denison, the principal did not approve any payroll postings. Um, for those, those of you that don't know, whenever um, exceptions are entered into our system as far as leave or um, overtime or whatever is going to affect payroll, the principal is supposed to go in and approve it. And in Denison, they didn't approve any of them. Um, that's a to that's a huge internal control deficiency. Um, they had unrecorded absences and overpayment to an employee due to posting errors. For Lake Alfred, that principal also did not approve any payroll postings, unrecorded absences, untimely postings to SAP, and one group of their non-exempt employees were not documenting their time worked. Um, we recommended that the principal over those two schools provided increased oversight, like I said, and stressed to them that had they been approving, some a lot of these findings would have probably been caught. Um, so that's, um, and we have like several payroll audits that are still in the works. We haven't completed them. That's why we're not reporting on them today. So based on that slide, you know, minimal findings at Arbondale and then substantial at Denison and Lake Alfred, what is the tenure of those two principals? Is these principals that are stepping into this role um, or is it something that they've just failed to, you know, have the proper oversight? Uh, they're, they're experienced principals. They just failed to perform those approvals and had very little oversight. So hopefully this served as a huge learning tool and we'll get them back on track as they both assured us they will. So um, it happens and we, I mean, we never see a hundred percent, but um, approval by the principals, but We'd like to see some percent. Well, and I, I, and I guess the reason I asked that question because of the first line in both those did not approve any underline. So that was alarming to me. So um, yeah. you guys do a fabulous job. So I'm sure we'll be checking back in with those two principals to make sure that they're on the right track. So thank you for that. Yeah, it was kind of interesting to us with this being a experienced principal. Um, she didn't even know how to go in. We had to show her how to go in and approve those. So I don't know the answer of this organization as large as it is, you know, why information kind of slips through the cracks sometimes. But I always say that these audits serve such a great learning tool because we do spend so much time with the school really teaching them, you know, how to, how to do it right. Could it have been a, go ahead, I'm sorry, Heather, go ahead. Wanted to um, add that on, we recognize this in reviewing the audits done by Carol and her department. On February 3rd, we held a principal training to, um, to show them how to do this and also included several screenshots. Um, and we, provide, we plan to provide updates and also to support the principals. My staff is doing a monthly two-hour Teams call with all the principal secretaries. So we're going over payroll procedures, um, different roles, duties, budget amendments, um, accounting transactions so that they can help support their principals. So we're going to, we're trying to do um, our part by making sure that they have the training they need and, and following up with that piece. Is, 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 is 
silly as it sounds, it almost seems like there's a, did you do this at the end of the month? You know, there's a checklist, a post-it note in the corner of your monitor saying, you know, A, B, C, did I go down these items? Because again, you know, it was underlined none, you know, no payroll posting at SAP. Uh, you know, did I do that? So I, I, but you're, you're right. The audit is incredibly important. And, and the big thing that I think is, if we weren't catching it at all, it'd be cause for concern, but we are, we are seeing these things and, and educating and offering um, support to those principals to get them on the right track. I like that checklist idea. I'm going to use it. Well, it, it, well, it's kind of, you know, it, it, it is, is, you know, seemingly you think, wow, really at that, at that particular level, do we need to, you know, and, and I hate using micromanage, but yeah, you kind of do on something like that. Um, checks and balances are important. So um, yeah, I think it's critical that there's these, these lists of tasks that have to be completed when it comes to payroll, um, because, you know, we're like, like she said, we're never going to see hundred percent, but I think that, uh, as we, as we continue to do these audits and we, we want to strive to get better, um, that it almost seems like some kind of standardization, um, would be helpful across the district, uh, to let these instances not fall through the cracks but and then again too you can you can you can produce and supply all kinds of information because we do training right but you still find those um issues where it gets by so but i think the big the big picture for me there is um the audits are fabulous and we're catching them and that's that's the big deal so mm -hmm. well, at the end of every audit we also do a um conference with the principal and the payroll secretary to go over all our findings and answer any questions and they have lots of questions usually and um at, so it's like a training tool and what we recommend with the payroll approval is that they put it on their calendar a calendar reminder to pop up at the middle of the month at the end of the month because they're going to be approved either by the principal or by payroll whenever payrolls run so if they hit it before payrolls run then they'll get it so we recommend they set up a payroll reminder um, at the month, you know, and some principals are like, we're going to go in every Friday, we're going to go in every Thursday, whatever, they're going to, they've come up with some process. So, you know, we give them ideas, and ideas what we hear from other schools. So, you know, what they do with those, we can only hope they'll. And, and not to be a dead horse, CC, and I'm glad that you brought that up. And I would say, look at those schools, for instance, on this, this slide, you know, Auburndale had minimal findings. What are those best practices from those principals that are doing the right way? Hey, what are you doing? And let's, you know, let's duplicate those best practices um, and, uh, you know, district wide um, to, to, you know, I guess, help out. Yeah. yeah. And we do that too. Like even with the payroll secretary, Terry, we're like, you know, we saw this at two other schools, how they're doing it. And it seems to be working. So, you know, and some of them are very thankful and appreciative. So, um, we like to think that we're hitting them and, and, you know, getting some positive feedback from them. So. CC, could you, um, could you explain, or Heather, could you explain where this fits in with a bigger audit done by a third party? Does this, I know this helps us um but are we, if 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 you've caught this and corrections have been made that's got to help with whatever the bigger overall audit is correct i mean does that does that lessen um, yes, their correct findings me, correct me if i'm wrong carol but i believe when um like cla comes in and does our 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 district-wide audit, I believe they rely on our work as far as payroll audits and um, and the state also. Is that correct, Carol? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And okay. you'll recall we had a finding in the um, last district audit about the payroll function. And so we really appreciate Heather and her team for um, adding a training element there. So between our internal audits and training, um, you know, that's what we're, our goal is, is to improve the overall efficiency and effectiveness of that function. And we should see that in the results of the district audit. 
there, um, I'd like to add, Carol, since we are still seeing those findings currently, mm -hmm. there's a chance they'll show up in our next audit. But mm -hmm. as Carol referenced, um, we can provide you know documentation for we've done this training, um, we're moving forward, we're improving things. And I um, we're looking for ways to help them and simplify. I think it on, I know for me on the outside, you don't think about all the different pieces that the principals deal with every day. They have so much going on. So anything that we can give them to reference or help remind them is a great tool because it's, it's like they operate their own little company with each school. Can I add a question or maybe a comment to that? Yeah. Um, within SAP, is there an opportunity to create a hard stop that the principals are going to have to execute so that it doesn't turn into an internal control deficiency by not doing it? And then could you add in email distributions to them prior to the deadline so that it reminds them of getting it done versus relying on sort of a paper-based checklist system? Well, that's, I'll let, go ahead, Heather. That's something we can look into, but in regards to payroll, we're required to pay employees for the time worked. So if the principals don't approve them, they, um, they are auto approved. So I think maybe we, we can look at that hard stop, but another option would be an enhanced report that we could pull that shows before, before the auto approval takes place that can show, um, you know, Principal Smith did not approve and then assign staff or, or an auto generated email to reach back out, maybe build that into the timeline a couple extra days. So we're looking at um, some different options like that. And in regards to SAP, I don't know if we told you all this, but um, our current license will run out in about three to five years. Um, we have to move to a different platform. So starting next year, we're gonna begin the transition into um, more than likely the, um, a different version of SAP, what we have now, which will have some enhanced functionality, hopefully to help us with a lot of our different audit findings. So we're in the discovery, um, we'll begin the discovery process around August, August to September. That was an excellent uh, recommendation, Chris. Thank you for that. And I think, you know, I, I, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think with the danger of a hard stop is if it doesn't get addressed, then payroll doesn't get approved. And like you said, we, it, auto, it auto approves if the principal doesn't, but I think the hard stop would, would potentially cause a problem there. But I, I do like the, the, the reminders. And I was thinking in my mind while you were saying that, Chris, is that, you know, we all have these calendars and especially the district, these things are intertwined as an organization. And you know, calendar reminders. Um, we're married to our digital devices, right? So that could definitely be helpful. So great, great input there. Okay, I have a question. Are y'all not seeing my hand up? I keep getting skipped over. Oh, so sorry. Oh, no. no. <laughs> oh, maybe I need to make a doctor. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had I had a twofold question. Uh, my first question was, what was the timeline? What was the date uh, that this audit covered? And then my second part to my question is, once you find these types of deficiencies, how far back do you go? So these are audits of our current fiscal year, and we just choose a week um, to look at the records for each school. And then we look at some things for year to date, such as overtime and um, approvals and things of that nature. Um, so it is just the sample for the current school year, and we would not go back unless we found some kind of fraud. Um, we have had payroll investigations, and we've gone back three years. Um, we've had a recent one that we reported to you guys a couple, of, maybe this year, maybe last, but um, a typical payroll audit, we just look at the processes and um, sample just the small sample just to say kind of give them a checkup of how they're doing okay thank you welcome anything else before we move on okay 
Okay. So the next thing is uh, we, as a district, contract with Car Riggs and Ingram, different team, and they perform agreed upon procedures for major construction projects for the purpose of determining the final construction cost and the adjusted guaranteed maximum price as provided by the construction manager. Um, engagement letters were signed late March with Car Riggs and Ingram for their services for the next two major construction projects. Barto High School Master Phase One and Davenport Elementary. Um, so they are those those jobs are underway and we'll report on their findings when they're completed. But we've used this um, process and this firm for over 15 years, and you know their work has resulted in a net savings to the district. And I'll let Cece talk about key card inventory. That's our last item. Okay, our purchasing department conducts an annual inventory of all purchasing cards. All card holders are supposed to send in a list of all the cards that they have in their possession as of a certain date. Um, and then we get all the forms and we verify the accuracy of the inventory. Um, at the time of the inventory, there were 688 active cards issued to 171 schools and departments. A um, couple of our findings, we had 10 cards that were not canceled timely. There was a school that closed and they had six, five cards um, that they didn't close until six months after the school closed. So the principal had already been relocated and those cards were still out there and active. Um, an employee retired six months prior and there were, then the cards were um, canceled at the time of the inventory. Um, a lost card was not reported to purchasing. So therefore that card was out there five months prior to it being closed and canceled. And then two cards were never received by the card holder. So those had to be canceled and um, and reissued. However, they were purchasing was never notified in a timely manner to cancel those cards. Six of the inventory forms contained errors when the card holders reported them. Um, the incorrect last four digits of three card numbers were listed and the incorrect or missing expiration dates for three cards were listed. And we've issued a report to the purchasing department um, with these findings. Like Cece said, this is just on the inventory of the cards. And then at another time of the year, we will sample expenditures made with the purchasing cards and report on that. That's all we have for internal audit. All right. Thank you, Carol and Cece, for sharing with us those. You guys do a fabulous job. As always, uh, this time we're going to open it up for public comments if there's no questions. We need some music while we're waiting. Do, 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 do. Having seen nobody making public comments, we will move on to the next agenda item, which is to set the next meeting date tentatively scheduled for August 2nd. And there is discussion out there because, and I let me say, I thank you to everybody this morning for moving our time from nine to 10. I was double booked by the district. I'm a popular guy, so <laughs> uh, thank you all for that. But that being said, um, I would like to open it up for, for you guys if you prefer to go back to nine o'clock or if you wanna do 10 o'clock, um, just because the, the willingness to move was was so great. I just wanted to make sure that we're using everyone's time uh, the most efficient for you because you guys do volunteer of your time and we appreciate that. So um, comments on that is nine o'clock preferred, 10 o'clock preferred. Everybody's kind of, it's okay, whatever. Okay, well, I'm a fan of nine. So we'll, we'll revert back to nine o'clock. I'd rather get it out of the way in the morning. 
Um, unless there's any other, if you have a scheduling conflict, let, let Carol know. But I appreciate you all. Uh, we'll schedule the next meeting for August 2nd at 9 o'clock. Thank you, thank you, thank you again to everybody for, for showing up and, and um, donating of your time. Um, appreciate the feedback as always. And we will see you next time.